Well, hello there. How are we? Welcome back to Here's Looking at You Film, a podcast for the vintage cinephile with modern sensibilities. I'm your host, Nikki. And first, I have a small correction to make, actually two. So last week, I mentioned a podcast called Cold Cuts. Well, as I was in the process of releasing the episode, there was actually a name change to their podcast. Long story, but you can go listen to their last audio blog and they explain the whole thing. It's now the Cult Worthy Podcast and Antonio, the host, actually sent me an amazing article. This is the other thing. He sent me an amazing article about how the ladies of Grey Gardens may have actually been affected by the mold in their home in their brains, and that may be why they were so super eccentric. It was such a good read, and I'm going to drop it in the show notes below. So make sure you go and check out the Cult Worthy Podcast. Now, our film today. As you can see, it's not a family film by any means. I know that was our theme for the month, but because I do this podcast by myself, I can make decisions that make me happy, and I hope you're okay with that sometimes. So I've been trying to watch Sabrina with Audrey Hepburn for weeks um, before Grey Gardens uh, this week. And I just keep changing my mind. It never felt good. So you'll see that flick with me another time. However, I've had a movie on my mind for a while now. And I was going to try to wait to do this one closer to Valentine's Day, Black History Month. But I couldn't wait. (laughs) So it's a film that's near and dear to my heart. I know a couple of people who will probably be very amused that I am talking about this movie. It's one of my top films of the all time. Spike Lee's 1986 classic, She's Gotta Have It. She's Gotta Have It was Spike Lee's first feature length film and was one of the first films to depict Black people as characters living regular lives, not like pimps, prostitutes, and gangsters like the Black exploitation films of the 70s and early 80s. Finding a film where Black sexuality and sensuality wasn't intermingled with violence or crime was rare. So this was a step into the new era of Black film, a charge that Lee would definitely lead for years and years. The characters in this film could have very well been white or any other nationality, ethnicity, and the only thing that would have changed is some of the speech or vernacular, but the plot would have worked regardless of color. Even Brooklyn itself never feels unsafe or sinister the way that some films will depict Black communities in New York. It feels comfortable, homely, and sometimes even a little bit magical. This is like the Black romantic experience from a Black gaze. We often talk about film from a female gaze, writing from a female gaze, but we don't talk often enough about writing and filmmaking from a Black gaze, and this is a perfect example of what that looks like. So uh, I'm trying to get through this opening as fast as possible because I know this is going to be a long episode. But um, so, you know, we usually try to go through the mains on the cast. Uh, The cast here is not super well known, but like also very iconic and important. Um, Tracy Camilla Johns plays Nola Darling, our main character. Tommy Redmond Hicks plays Jamie Overstreet. John Canada Terrell as Greer Childs. Spike Lee himself plays Mars Blackman. Ray Dowell plays Opal Gilstrap. Joali, which is Spike Lee's sister, plays Clarinda Bradford. Dennis Karika plays the trainer. Bill Lee, who is Spike Lee's dad, plays Sonny Darling. And S. Apatha Merkerson plays Dr. Jameson. So we've got a cast list here that probably doesn't sound too familiar, but because this is such an iconic film, everybody that plays a part in the film is so iconic. So most of our other films have been pretty straightforward with some underlying subtext, but this one is a Spike Lee joint, so we'll have quite a bit to talk about. Along with the plot, I'll be lacing in my personal thoughts from the perspective of Black, single, and woman. Um, I'm really excited about talking about this film so we can jump right in. So the film starts with a Zora Neale Hurston quote from Their Eyes Were Watching God. I'm going to read this quote to you. Ships at a distance, have every man's wish on board. For some, they come in with the tide. 
For others, they sail forever on the horizon, never out of sight, never landing, until the watcher turns his eyes in resignation, his dreams mocked to death by time. That is the life of men. Now, women forget all those things they don't want to remember and remember everything they don't want to forget. The dream is the truth. Then they act and do things accordingly. Now, what does this mean? Um, I've seen a couple of different interpretations of this, but my favorite interpretation is, in short, men are allowed to dream to their heart's content and go follow those dreams to get whatever they want. Even if they never succeed at getting those dreams, just the chasing of the dream is considered like a manly expedition. Women aren't given the luxury of being go-getters and getting what we want, chasing our dreams, doing what we like. Our dream is typically the reality that we end up in. And we, quote unquote, act and do things accordingly as if the lives we're living in are what we always wanted, even if they're not. So our opening sequence takes us to our neighborhood, which is Fort Greene. Uh, if you're not familiar with uh, New York and Brooklyn in general. Fort Greene uh, used to be a predominantly Black neighborhood um, that has since, uh, like a lot of other neighborhoods in Brooklyn, become heavily gentrified. And that's a whole other conversation for a whole other time. But um, our opening sequence starts, it's there. Um, now the film is done mostly in Black and white. Uh, now, commonly in black and white film, you'll see some of like the darker saturation diffused to create this blurry, almost dreamy effect and lightened. Like if you think of, I don't know if you've ever seen Casablanca, we'll talk about that. Well, obviously we're going to talk about that movie. But if you've ever seen that, it's sort of like this like hazy look. But Spike Lee leaves the darker parts heavily saturated um, and doesn't blur anything out, creating this sort of rough indie feel, but it really highlights um, the blackness in a beautiful way. And Spike is known for his iconic opening sequences. Um, and this is no different even as being his first film, uh, laying the groundwork for Brooklyn to play a role as his, kind of its own character in this film. Also, to be honest, watching this opening sequence brought up mad nostalgic feelings for me because this was shot in like 1985. And I was born in the late 80s. And they show shots of kids playing. And these kids look like me as a kid. And you watch some movies and it's like, oh, they're showing old shots. But these were shots at the time. These weren't vintage photos that Spike had found. These were photos taken in the mid 80s in Brooklyn. After our credit sequence ends, there's a few quick cuts around the city, very like Brooklyn looking shots. You know, any movie that takes place in Brooklyn these days has to show like a train line, the Brooklyn Bridge, maybe like a hood or two. And these days, maybe there's like a farmer's market, depending on what kind of movie you're looking at. Those kind of shots. Anyway, so we cut into a bedroom and we see a figure under the covers rolling around a bit, trying to either get comfy or work themselves awake. You know, like when you have to get up, but you kind of like kick your legs around and roll around a little bit. I think that we're psychologically trying to get rid of all the cool spots in the bed so that we don't have motivation to stay there. That's my little theory. But anyway, they eventually roll awake and we're presented with our main character. Now, I'm going to be real with you. One of my favorite things about this film, every time I watch it back, is how Nola is this very sexually awakened woman who doesn't present with today's ideal of the sex positive woman. Now, obviously this was shot in 1985. So the ideals of beauty and especially black beauty were way different. Nola has this like shaped up fro, a very like regular sized body. And that's it, beautiful, very little makeup. Um, and not to get too far off topic, but like even in the modernized series of She's Gotta Have It that they tried to do a few years back, their main character has like long braids and a very small body, which has sort of become like the black natural ideal, like waist beads, long braids, really taut, small body. You know, you do yoga and meditate, that kind of my ideal. Now, when black women want to go natural, like hair wise, the pattern is typically cut the perm off, braid it up until it grows out long enough, and then you rock a big pretty fro once you have enough hair. That short middle fro period 
isn't really an acceptable look for Black women right now unless they have very thin, slightly Eurocentric features like looser curls in their hair pattern, especially combined with lighter skin. Now, even the fact that Nola has darker skin in this film is really satisfying to me. I could go on about this forever. But anyway, she sits up, she looks straight into the camera with these piercing, sort of seductive eyes. Like she could literally trap you on accident. She really actually looks kind of like Kelly Rowland uh, in the face. Okay, I've, I've really harped on about this enough. Now, here's where we get the title card revealing her name. Nola Darling. What a fucking name. Jeez. <laughs> Nola began speaking directly into the camera, saying the only reason she decided to do this, presumably the film, is to clear her name. She wants people to know that she's not a freak, and in fact, she hates that word. She hates all labels. Now, right after that, we meet Jamie Overstreet on the park bench. Every time we meet a new character, we get a title card with their name. Um, now, Jamie Overstreet believes that everyone has a soulmate. They just rarely meet and are destined to wander, but he believes that he's met his soulmate in Nola. We cut to a shot of them in the dark, sitting up but sort of cuddled, and he's just basically professed his love to her, swearing on his grandmother's Bible, which is heavy, right? So she seems very taken with his confession, and he hurriedly takes his clothes off, and she lights the candles in her room almost ritualistically. She has this beautiful headboard where she has all these candles. And she tells him that she loves him. She's running on E, to which he responds, you're always running on E, which <laughs> I, can, I can relate to a little bit. <laughs> now we get one of those beautiful black love scenes that I was talking about, done in slow motion with really brassy jazz music in the background. This whole soundtrack, by the way, was done by Spike Lee's dad. So all the beautiful music you're hearing, it's in the family, right? And if you know how Spike likes his music, you know exactly what I mean by that brassy jazz music. And when Jamie goes down on Nola, she's like smiling, happy, giggling. We get a side profile of Jamie's face when he's presumably climaxing. He looks so satisfied peaceful, like real soulmate-like sex, you know? And there's like a, so there's a certain kind of sex where you're both just kind of trying to finish and you want to like make sure you get off. And then there's a whole separate kind where you just kind of like enjoy each other. And this kind of seems like that kind of sex. But after they finish, there's like a very quick shot of two candles right next to each other. And one candle is still burning while the other's gone out. And that seems kind of metaphorical and shit, you know? But Nola lays on her stomach next to Jamie and he's laying on his back. She asks him for a massage and he happily obliges. And she compliments his touch saying that a lot of men that she's been with don't know anything about a woman's body. Jamie asks Nola why they can't do it at his place. And she says she can only do it in her bed. And the whole film pretty much takes place um, at her apartment most of the time. Next, we meet Clorinda Bradford, played by Joali, which is, uh, or Joy. I think it's, I think it's Joie because it's J-O-I-E, but it could be Joy. But uh, Joali, Joy Lee, um, Spike Lee's sister. So she and Nola used to be roommates, but Nola kept having different dudes over every day. And C Clorinda ain't like that. Like all these strangers in her space in her bathroom, which I completely understand. And Nola was basically like, well, I found a place. So if you don't like it, bye. And so she was like, okay, bye. So they fell out for a minute. Now they're on okay terms, but Clorinda kind of misses Nola because they really haven't spoken in a while. And Nola goes into a small rant right after this about how there's two types of men, good ones and dogs. And then we get some a1 prime pickup lines. Now, I have to read some of these pickup lines to you because they are like so. They're, I don't even want to say they're 80s. They're just ridiculous. You so fine, I drink a tub of your bath water. <sighs> Congress has just approved me to give you my heat and moisture seeking MX missile. <sighs> um, I know I only saw you for the first time in my life a minute ago, but I love you. 
I got my BA from Morehouse, my MBA from Harvard. I own a new BMW 318i. I make $53,000 a year after taxes, which actually for 1985 was like bowler. And I want you to want me. Girl, I got plenty of what you need. 10 throbbing inches of USDA, government inspected, prime cut, grade A, tube steak. Oh my gosh. But okay, this is probably my favorite one. You may not realize it tonight, but you're sending out some very strong vibes. May I continue? Well, you're lonely. You're alone. You're sad. You're confused. You're horny. You see, you need a man like me to understand you, to hold you, to caress you, to love you. You need me. What's your number? So I'm not even going to lie. If I was like, if I had been drinking, that one probably would have got me. I was so sorry. But like, the rest of them were horrible. Okay. So Noah after this says that one guy was different. And that was Jamie. He came at her real classy. So he was standing at a bus stop when she walked by. And he had to follow her. Which, of course, we know is a little bit creepy. But also, like, at the time, it's romantic in movies. Following people is not good in real life. Do not follow people. But, you know, if you're in a movie, you can follow people. So she turned, saw him following her, and she kind of, like, smirks, but she doesn't stop walking. This actually serves as a really great moving shot, showing us, like, the hustle and bustle of Brooklyn, storefronts, conversations, the people. There's so much life that's going on, and he ends up almost losing her in the crowd and he's frantically looking for her down alleyways in stores um she surprises him because she's waiting behind a, like a subway entryway with like a big ass smile after a little banter about who was following who jamie's like i don't want a chance not seeing you again whatever you want to do i'll do whatever you want to go i'll take you will you see me yeah that's good that's how you do it. How could how could you possibly say no to that? And Jamie ain't Jamie ain't ugly. He cute. You can't say no to that. Next, we meet Mars Blackman, played by Spike Lee himself. Now, while people like Hitchcock and more recently like Stan Lee like to take a very small role in their films, R.I.P. Stan Lee, Spike liked to play an integral role in his early films, often also sparing him some casting budget because he could just be in the film instead of hiring an extra person. Mars is giving like big black frame glasses, similar to like the glasses that Spike wears, wears now, just like way more 80s. I actually have a pair and I may pop a picture of them on the Life Pod Insta. Anyway, so Mars is like... <sighs> Mars is like that piece of shit dude that talks too much and you know you shouldn't mess with him. But like for some reason, like annoying toxic dudes sometimes just have good dick. Like it's a shame. It's 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 why Future keeps having kids. Um so Mars is giving like 80s version of the baby. And if you don't know who that is, just take a second and look up the baby. And Danny Lee, and you'll understand what I'm saying. He's not, Mars isn't that bad, but you know, he's got that same kind of like personality. Mars said he messed with Nola because he heard she was a freak. And even though she sees other dudes, she got that thing, you know what I'm saying? She, so apparently, all men want freaks, they just don't want to marry them, which is. Which is weird to me, right? Like, I, I totally get, like, the whole Madonna whore complex thing. But imagine being into certain stuff, finding someone that, like, hits the way you need them to hit. But, like, not wanting to keep that level of freaky in your life because you want to have, like, an upset. I don't know. Like, that's weird. You're man weird. Like, what? What? Any Anyway, so Mars comes over on his bike and he's looking around at her apartment like he's like, it's about time you let me come up here. So he's looking around. She tells him that her birthday is May 19th, the same day as Malcolm X. And he starts talking about how the place is nice. He could move in if they put a divider up as like he's talking like it's a joke. But then he gets really serious when she insinuates that. He would want to like live off her because he he doesn't want to give that feel at all. Like he's he even though he ain't got a good job, he's his own man. 
Um, so she reveals to him that she does layout paste up work for magazines, which is actually like a dope ass job. She's got a dope job. She's got a dope place in Brooklyn. Sounds like somebody I know. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Say no more. You know what I'm saying? So let me say this. I know Mars. If you have lived in any kind of black community, you know Mars. Not like, obviously not the real one, but you know that guy. Like, Mars's character gets on my last nerves, but I also know that he is so funny. And like, if he caught you at the right moment, you would let him hit and it would be good. And you would be mad as hell because you cannot let dudes like that know they got good, good. Otherwise, they get a little too big for their britches. And Mars is definitely one of them too big for his britches kind of dudes. Anyway, back to Jamie. So Nola has always been clear about her proclivities with all of her men. So he knows about her and the other guys. And he even said he thought there was something going on with Nola and this woman, Opal. But she said no. And Nola couldn't lie even if she tried. Matter of fact, she is brutally honest. So let's talk about Opal Gilstrap. So baby literally literally starts talking about how none of us are 100% gay or straight. And we have the potential to go either way. And we're on a spectrum. So... Opal knew she liked women at a young age, and while she knows Nola is straight, she just wants her to, quote-unquote, be open-minded. Um, Oprah, Opal is clearly like her feminine energy crush, but she's also kind of a predator, and we'll talk about that later. Like, you know, like, but feminine energy. Like, men suck at taking care of women and empathizing with our problems sometimes. So a lot of girls have, like, a BFF or a friend circle to help them with those times, but Nola has all this, like, sexual energy that even like her feminine interactions have to have some kind of like hormonal undertones um so she comes over nola has a summer cold and opus opals at her home making her tea and taking care of her so when nola mentions that jamie's coming to check on her every day opal is clearly disgusted and even hearing his name and once nola goes silent and opal asks what she's thinking nola's like well what is it like to make love to a woman Opal tries to get Nola to admit that she's either done it before or she must at least want to, considering how much she likes sex, but Nola just genuinely wants to know. And Opal says she can say what it's not. It's not some musty man pounding away inside of you a mile a minute. And Nola's like, what's wrong with that? (laughs) Which I was also like, what's wrong with that? (laughs) Um, But Opal gets irritated and basically she's like, well, if you know... If you, I mean, if you want to know, you know where to come find out. Okay, so there's a knock at the door after that, and it's Jamie. They say quick highs to each other and pretend to be pleasant, but obviously they do not like each other. But Nola tells Jamie that Opal was nice enough to sit with her all day. He looks at Opal and was like, thanks, but I'll take care of her now. And Nola tells Opal, like, you can stay as long as you want to, girl. But Jamie's like, I just want her to know it's okay to leave if she wants to. Like, she's not even speaking to Opal, just Nola. And Nola's okay. Nola says, it's okay. We have a lot of fun. And uh, what kind of fun? Fun, fun. And Nola's ass gonna shrug and say, we do. (laughs) Girl, you know Jamie do not like that. So Jamie goes to put up the groceries. Nola has fallen straight to sleep. And Jamie tells Opal that she's good. She can go. And she's like, well, I like nursing Nola. And he said, well, you like the nurse? Go work at the hospital. Bye. And he and Opal have a short back and forth that ends with Opal saying, it's not over yet, right before she leaves. So Jamie immediately runs over to Nola, wakes her up. But she, when she wakes up, she's like, where's Opal? And Jamie's like, I'll be a son of a bitch. And he asks Nola what's going on with them. And she very truthfully tells him Opal is obviously interested in her, but her no game is very strong. And Jamie trusts Nola does not like opal okay greer childs greer childs we are meeting greer childs he's sitting in his very expensive drop top when we meet him he says he's the best thing that ever happened to nola and she worshiped him she was in his words a typical brooklyn tack head when he met her but he refined her molded her Until she was 
led astray by common street trash with all of his hard work undone. Because clearly, she's honest with everybody, so he knows that she's getting it from other dudes as well. Cut to Greer and Nola hanging at her place, and she's working on a print while he's just kind of looking at himself and working out. Nola seems pretty amused at how much he seems to be into himself, even saying that he would probably marry himself if he could. And he asks if she'd like to join him in working out, but she's clearly working. And he says, and I quote, if you get fat, you know I'm leaving you, right? You know, if you weren't fine, I wouldn't even bother with you. And she just like chuckles and she's unbothered. She's actually a full queen. I think just knowing how much access she has to these different men, it's like, okay, thank you so much. But also, you know, I can dispose of you in two seconds. Immediately, the next scene, Greer is scolding Nola for ordering a salad. They're at like a really nice restaurant. And he's saying that she should have ordered the steak, even though he was just talking about her working out. After a little short squabble about what healthy meats are, Greer gets on the subject of Jamie and Mars, calling them her quote unquote two hoodlum friends. Of course, she defends them. And when Greer tells her that she should leave those other two and he's everything she needs, she simply responds with, you are tripping. So the thing that I do like about her is that she never talks badly about any of these guys in front of the other guys. There's never uh, talking badly about them to make the guy feel better, which is something that you see commonly when men are like cheating or I mean, anybody, not even just men. But when people are cheating sometimes or when they're with someone else, they'll talk about their spouse or their former spouse in a bad way in order to talk up that new person. Um, And she never does that. She never lets them talk badly about each other. And she will never talk badly about them either, which I appreciate about her. So the next scene, they're doing toe touches together. And I know um, Greer kind of has his feet spread wider than her and is taking up way more space to do the exact same thing that Nola is doing. And that feels metaphorical too, but maybe I'm just reaching. Anyway, he stops to tell her that he got a call from his agency and he's going to be on the cover of GQ. She kisses him and congratulates him, but he tells her his career is taken off and he wants her by his side. She doesn't even respond to him. She just says, don't say another word. And she goes straight to the bed and she starts to undress. And there's this tribal music with chanting and drums playing in the background. Um, And Nola's like waiting for this man to get into bed for her. She's already naked, waiting under the covers. But he literally has to carefully fold everything as he takes it off. His shirt, pants, socks, underwear. Finally, after like two or three minutes, he finally climbs into bed with Nola fully naked and the sex commences and they're all over the bed covers thrown off crumpled sheets they're like right on top of each other it looks sweaty animalistic like way different than like this soulmate sex that she's getting with jamie this is that like let's just get a water pitcher and keep it next to the bed because we're not moving for a couple hours kind of sex so if we were wondering why she puts up with this man this is probably it (laughs) so now we cut the punk ass mars talking about how he thinks the reason that Nola is doing all that boning, quote unquote, is because she had a bad relationship with her father, even though he's not a psychologist or anything. So now we meet Nola's dad, Sonny Darling, played by Spike Lee's dad, Billy. When we meet him, he's playing the piano because he is super talented. He tells us how normal Nola was even though she hates the word normal. She was exposed to camps, ballet, acting lessons, music lessons. She was only child, so her parents doted on her and did everything they could to enrich her childhood. And she never wanted to stick to one thing for too long, but her parents were always encouraging. The only weird thing that Sunny can remember about Nola is that she crawled backwards before she walked, but her dad was clearly there, and both of her parents tried to give her as much love and encouragement as they could. On her birthday, Jamie gives her a card, but then he says he has another surprise for her and he makes her click her heels and say there's no place like home, you know, with her eyes closed. When she opens them, 
We're greeted with a hand-drawn sign that says, Happy Birthday, Nola, surrounded by balloons and string. And the scene is in full color. And we're at Fort Greene Park, and Jamie's gotten Nola this performance at the park for her birthday with these two dancers. And the song playing during this duet is an original song. I think it's called Nola. And it basically lays out the story of a woman in, who's free and roams however she pleases. Um, though many may fall for her, and it may not be good for them. The routine is this beautiful modern ballet routine. It feels like a really playful dance between lovers during a picnic. And Jamie also gets her cake with a trick candle, which is super cute and funny. And later that night, she's in bed with Jamie, clearly because he did all this cute shit for her birthday. So obviously she's going to spend a night with him. And um, she questions him about how much the dance was, asks if she can pay for half. Um, so it's clearly one of those like, oh, you did a really cute relationship thing for me, but like, this isn't a relationship. So let me like help you go in on it. Um, he's trying to be super romantic and says he would spar starve a week for her if he had to. So the phone rings, Jamie hands it to her and it's Mars <laughs> and he's trying to come over and give her a birthday pipe. But she's like, no, I'm asleep. He says, no, 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 just let me smell it. <laughs> And she started laughing. And she like, blink it off my phone. But he is so funny. So uh, he asks if Jamie's there. But she hangs up before um, she answers. Um, so he ends up just calling this girl Roxanne. It's not even a big deal. But anyway, Jamie asks about the convo. And she tells him the truth. That Mars wanted to come over. But she told him it was too late. But Jamie's like, well, why didn't you just tell Mars I was here? And he starts asking about it. And she's like, <laughs> She falls asleep so fast. Um, so cut to Jamie talking to the camera on a park bench, doing his little confessional thing again, talking about this poetry that he writes for Nola. But Mars basically says Jamie is like really corny and soft. So we cut to this long cut of Mars sucking on Nola's nipple and licking at her belly button. And we also find out that Mars has sex with his shoes on. Anyway, they're laying in bed. Mars asks if he's better than Jamie and Greer. And she's like, that's a stupid question. And then he's like telling her he's in love with her. And she's like, no, we are not in love. We're in like, you love my love making. That's it. She's trying to go to sleep. And he's like, did I ever tell you about the time I was a superhero? She was like, nah, much, I must have missed that one. So he just pulls goes under the covers and puts her drawers on his head. And he's like, I used to be panty man. And so she laughs. And he's like, well, do Jamie and Greer make you laugh like this? She's like, no, but they do not put they pan my panties on their head. So he ends up asking Nola to grease his scalp, which, if you don't know, is a really intimate black ritual, asking someone to kind of grease your scalp. So Mars wants to talk about Jamie and Greer again. He ends up calling Jamie a 16-piece chicken McNugget head and talks shit about Greer's like slick back perm hair. So he petitions for Nola to leave them again, and she is not even engaging in combo. So he resorts to making her laugh again, which is always kind of what he does when he wants to have a serious conversation with her and she doesn't engage. Um, that subsequently leads to more sex. Meanwhile, Jamie is calling back to back to back. So Nola ends up, Mars is like, you want me to pick up? Nola's like, yeah. And he just kind of kicks the phone off the uh, hook. So now it's a busy signal and Jamie's never going to get through. So Jamie's tired of being an option. Um, and Greer is also kind of getting fed up. But, you know, he's like rude and has no tact. So he's telling her that she needs professional help. But she's like, sir, nobody told you to stay. Like, I told you what this is. He claims he cares about her. He wants to help. And we here we meet Dr. Jameson. Going on Greer's advice, she actually goes to see a doctor once a week for a while to figure out what's going on. And Nola's complaining that Greer is only upset because she's being honest with him. Dr. Jameson tries to explain to her that the peak of female sexuality is in her brain, not between her legs. And she's really looking for love to satisfy her, but she's not finding it in these guys. Now, Nola ends up stopping not visiting anymore but Jameson thinks Dr. Jameson thinks that in her opinion like Nola's really healthy and Greer obviously doesn't like that because he wanted somebody to tell Nola that she was sick so after a series of very snowy pictures of Fort Green Park we find Jamie praying over their Thanksgiving meal they being Jamie Nola 
Greer, and Mars. Nola has invited them all over to meet officially. And of course, it's a mess. They didn't even know they were going to be meeting. And Greer is pretending to be overly classy. Mars is being Mars. And Jamie basically thinks he's the bottom bitch. Nola asks him to cut the turkey. He cuts Jamie like the small. Uh, he cuts like the smallest piece for Mars that he can cut. So Greer starts complimenting him, Neil, and says that Nola needs to try his homemade sweet potato pie. But then my man Jamie said he came through with the Martinelli's apple cider, which we all know is the most elite of apple ciders. Like to me, at that point, you bring the Martinelli's, you won. Oh, and like Mars ain't bring chat, obviously. But he starts doing that thing that he does when he makes Nola laugh by telling her some weird made-up story. And she getting her little kiki in. And Grizz's salty ass is like, oh, well, that's a lie. Like, no shit, Sherlock. Nola's not dumb. No one's dumb. But she's like, well, I believe him. Because that's still like her third of a boo. And she's always going to defend her boos. Then Mars is like, Jamie, like, I'm going to just flip. Let's flip a coin. And Nola's like, oh, you just going to decide my fate with a coin? So here comes Greer. Like, how long much I, must I tolerate these ignorant, low-caste, ghetto Negroes? Now, first of all, Jamie ain't even do nothing. So chill. Second of all, we all black. Why is that necessary? So they squabble for a minute so until Nola basically threatens to kick them all out. So they chill. They all start complimenting her on the food until Greer says this food is marrying material. Mars tells Greer that Nola would never marry a non-weightlifting, non-modeling, pseudo-black man like him. And Greer ain't like that. So he leaves the table and Nola follows. Now, part of this thing that irritated me about this dinner is like, I'm sure Nola knew that these men were not going to like necessarily get along. And she's acting very indignant and irritated that they won't just like get along with each other for her sake. When clearly they're all fighting over her and asking her to dump the other ones. I don't know why she thought that this was going to go well. But cut to them playing Scrabble. And of course, of course, Greer is trying to call Mars dumb. Mars puts the word gonna, G-O-N-N-A, which Greer decides to challenge and look up in the dictionary. And I think it's probably in the dictionary now, but it wasn't in 1985. And before he can find it, both Mars and Jamie decide to quit the game. Nola's fed up with how all of them are acting and she says she's going to go to bed. After she leaves the room, they have a quick argument and they basically decide they just all going to stay. However, Jamie gets into bed and lays next to Nola and Greer is sitting on a side chair. Mars is sort of sitting at the foot of the bed. Eventually, both Greer and Mars get fed up and leave because they're not getting the cuddle time. And Jamie and Nola are left to sleep peacefully. Then they're sort of cuddled. They look like a married couple after a tiring holiday. And even their outfits seem to complement each other more than like the other guys' outfits would have complimented Nola. It's kind of cute. Next scene, Nola is greeted by three women who break into her apartment. Um, and they're very upset with Nola's involvement with their men. One even claims to be pregnant with Mars's child. And she says she's from Brownsville, so she don't play that shit. And they all claim that all of the quote unquote good men are either in jail or gay. And Nola's taking all of the good ones that are left. So what do they do with her? They're going to set her bed on fire. But it's all a dream. And Nola frantically wakes up screaming, fire! But Jamie wakes up to comfort her. And he ends up asking her off the cuff if she's picked a movie for them to see later on. But she mentions she can't go because Mars needs help looking for a place. Jamie is not happy. And he reveals to Nola that he started seeing another woman, the dancer, the dance for Nola's birthday. Her name's Ava. Nola is not happy about that, even though she knows she really can't be mad, but she's still not happy. And he tells her it's been about two weeks, but he can't see multiple people. So Nola's going to need to make a decision about him. Now, some days later, while sunbathing with Greer, he tells her that he's planning to go to the Caribbean for two weeks. And he's gotten everything paid for for her to accompany him. And she says, like, I don't think I could stand to be around you for two weeks, which is mad honest and probably accurate considering all their interactions. Um, and so Jamie's doing another one of his bench confessionals. Mars rides up and randomly asks if he can just add a few more things in the middle of his confessional. So 
Mars says that Nola's not dependable and isn't where she says she'll be. But Jamie strongly disagrees and said it's never happened to him. Um, so Mars insists that Nola is as dependable as a ripped diaphragm. That is his quote. Horrible. Meanwhile, Mars and Jamie start talking about like a Celtics and Nick game at the garden. And they almost seem like they're bonding. Like they could be cool if it wasn't for this Nola situation. It's, and it almost seems like Mars really does want to be cool with Jamie. But Jamie's sort of just like, okay, Mars. <laughs> so back at Nola's house, Jamie's trying to get an answer out of Nola. She's like, it's not the right time, but soon. Jamie's like, yo, fuck soon. I've been hearing soon since day one. But Nola says, you know, she doesn't believe in regrets. And if he wants to leave, she won't regret it. But she still wants to see him. And he's like, uh, no, bye. And he dips just as Opal's arriving. And he says to Opal, you can have her. So Opal brings her ass in there acting like she's trying to comfort Nola. But she keeps hitting on this girl, getting closer and closer on the bed. And even after Nola tells her to chill, Opal still kisses this girl. And Nola ends up pulling away. And she's like, can you leave? She's a creepo. Like, you know me and my man just fought. Like, you're such a weirdo. Like, why would you do that right now? And I told you, I'm not gay. Like, stop. She's so weird. What a predator. So now Nola's in bed alone. And she started a little, like, self-love situation, but it's clearly not her way. She needs somebody else to apply that pressure, you know what I'm saying? So she calls Jamie. She asks him to come over, and he tells her to leave him alone. Call Greer Mars. Who cares? He's not here anymore. She is practically begging him to come over. And he eventually, he's like, it better be an emergency. He hangs up. He's laying next to Ava, the dancer. And she's like, who was that? And he's like, it's a friend in need. And Ava is not dumb. So she was like, I'm not going to be here when you get back. But he still gets up and goes. So now there's a series of like really um, artistic still shots of Jamie on the train. But all the photos are like blurry and out of focus. And I'm sure it like mimics what his brain must be like right now. He gets there at the house. He's in a black tank black leather jacket giving like dark and troubled bad boy tees and I think in every other scene in the movie he's worn like light colored or white shirts um so she's like well I knew you'd come if I asked and he's not having it so he says he thought it was an emergency and he's mad she throws out the oh I love you and he's like no you don't so she tries to kiss him and he pulls away from her. So she asks him to make love for her because she's she's feeling right now. She wants that. She wants that pressure. And my guy hits her with, oh, you don't want me to make love to you. You want me to fuck you. So, like, listen, I'm not even going to lie. Like, for a second, I was a little bit hyped. I'm like, oh, Jamie, like, okay. Like, I, you give her what you're supposed to give. And I had like that. But then he was, like, asking about Grand Mars while he was doing it. And she was saying it was hurting and it just, he looked like real crazy and that was not good. So afterwards, um, he finished, zipped up, and we'll talk more about this specific scene later on. Um, but he finished, he zipped up and he walks out. And before he leaves, he says, here I am trying to dog you out the best I can. And the worst part about it is I kind of enjoyed it. Yikes. And Noel is devastated that whatever just happened, happened. Not that's not what she wanted out of this ordeal. And this sort of also dismantles this like nice guy facade that Jamie's had this whole time. Like he seemed like he is like ultimately super caring of her, but the moment that he gets mad and out of control, he's willing to have the capacity to do that, to hear even from her that he's hurting her and continue. That's it's no bueno. So now we cut to Nola hanging with Clorinda. Yay! And Clorinda's playing her stand-up bass for Nola. And Nola just kind of decided to drop by. You know how, like, when we're going through a breakup or we're going through a thing and all of a sudden we remember our friends' phone numbers and addresses. So Nola tells Chloe that she's sure that Jamie hates her. And honestly, Chloe doesn't even, like, know what to tell her, which is, like, the realest kind of friend. Like, not trying to come up with solutions for problems that she doesn't know about. She hasn't been there in the situation for a while, so she doesn't know. But you can tell that, like, Nola's comforted with her presence, and Chloe's just happy that she came by. So, cut to Greer. He's explaining that he realizes that Nola never viewed him, Mars, or Jamie independently. They're more like 
an amalgamation of a boyfriend between the three of them. Uh, the tenderness of Jamie, Mars's fun humor, Greer's like posh sensibilities, this three-headed, six-armed, six-legged, three-penis monster. <laughs> At this point, Nola's decided to clear, uh, clean up her life a little bit. She cleans the old wax off her headboard, changes her sheets, and she calls both Greer and Mars to meet separately. So first she breaks things off with Greer, who does not take it easy at all. He insults her, tells her she doesn't have enough drive, even says he's going to go get a white girl, which is not unexpected. And she just kind of laughs at him. Mars, of course, is way more easygoing about it. He doesn't want it to end, but he's still mad funny. And Nola tells him, you know, you need to grow up. But obviously she still has love for him. So now she goes to find Jamie. Uh, she couldn't reach him at home, but she knew he would be at the park. She tells him that she wants to be exclusive. No more Greer Mars, but she wants to be celibate. Jamie's like, why now? Why do you want to be celibate now that it's just us? And she reminds him of the uh, rape-like sex that he had with her, citing that as a reason that, you know, a reasonable reason to want to chill for a while. Um, she tells him she loves him. And he, Jamie feels like Nola's kind of jumping from one extreme to the next at this point. Like she wants to have sex with everybody. Now she don't want to have sex with nobody. He don't want to be on that ride. She sadly walks away until he calls her name. And when she returns, he says, if you mess up one more time, it's basically done. Immediately cuts her confessional where she says that her celibate city did not last long. And Jamie wanted a housewife kind of girl. Nola was just not that. She's not a one-man woman. And at the end of it all, she goes to bed alone, just like she woke up at the beginning of the movie. And the closing credits start with each of the main actors in the film stating their name while holding one of those movie slates, you know? <laughs> then we get a traditional rolling credit sequence over jazz music, which, as I mentioned, all composed by Spike Lee's dad, Bill Lee, who also played Sonny Darling. Okay, so I know that was a lot. I'm not going to hold you long, but you know we have to talk. So, like, first of all, I never thought I would be living as a single Black woman in Brooklyn in 2021. But this is, like, really empowering watching this again. I've watched it a couple of times in my life, never even with the concept of living in New York or Brooklyn or what that would be like. So watching it now and seeing what NOLA is like now really makes me it, it's inspiring and it is empowering even though the story is kind of convoluted and muddy now I used to think that Greer was right that Nola was like building this super titan of a boyfriend using these three guys even going so far as to have them meet but I don't feel that way anymore so I think that Nola was looking for a person that could actually make her care for someone deeper than she cared about herself um, and that could love her in a way that can make her feel loved in completion so she wouldn't have to love herself so much. None of these guys in the movie were able to do that for her. Um, Mars and Greer, both very shallow lovers, seemed to be good in bed, but also you know that they weren't relationship material. And I think when she met Jamie, she thought that maybe he could be the one. He could be the one to turn her. Um, even in every relationship in this film, Nola calls the shots. She goes to who she wants, when she wants, and she's honest about it. Even if she starts cutting people off, it's her choice to cut them off. Something as small as her friendship with Chloe, she picked out the place so she can have anyone in there that she wants, and Chloe can get out if she's not accepting of the situation. When she breaks up with, or when her and Jamie go through their thing, getting back with Jamie was an act of selfishness to give her control again. She had lost control of him and control of the situation, so much so that he was willing to violate her. And in order to find like order in her life again, I believe she felt she had to hurt Jamie back. Whether subconscious or not, her decision to get back with Jamie only led her to reasserting her authority over the situation and leaving with the upper hand, something that she clearly seeks in all of her interactions. She likes to reject, and she does not like the feeling of rejection. Nola's feelings always come first, and she's opted to substitute empathy with honesty. Either pill is poisoned with her. Either you stay and you deal with being the option, or you leave and you get no access at all. Now, I think it's interesting that all of the men that she was dealing with 
actually sort of fell in love with her in a way. And don't twist me. Lola seems bomb, like looks bomb, bomb personality. Like she would be super chill to hang out with. But the likelihood of three men who are actually good in bed falling in love with a woman that they all know is openly seeking other men I don't know. It's like pretty low. Maybe the 80s were like a way different time, but I don't know if most men have the self-esteem for that unless they're definitely down for polyamory. Also, um, speaking of the relationship access, Nola tells Jamie that she loves him more than once. The first time she tells him is while they're having sex. And the other times she tells him during conversations where he seems to be upset with her. She never says it to any of the others. On one hand, I think maybe she did sort of love Jamie more than the others because he fit more of her ideal. But on the other hand, it may have been her way of like keeping him. Mars said he loved her, but it felt more of like a girl, I love you, like a like a profession of love because he was so obsessed with her. Um, so she didn't really feel obligated to say it back. Remember, she was like, You're not in love with me, like you in love with the way I fuck. Plus, she knew he didn't really mean it. He was obviously seeing other women. Greer never claimed to love her. He mainly commented on her body and her potential. I don't think she could have kept Jamie for so long without telling him that she loved him or at least having like very deep feels with him. A lot of their scenes together are in these like shadowed dark rooms that feels like intimate, but also like they're both masking their feelings for the situation. She's getting as close as she can to Jamie, making him feel cared for, loved, but she knows that she has to spread that among these other two guys. He's making do with the situation and giving her as much love as he can. But you know this is torturing him. Everything is hidden in shadow. We have to talk about the assault. Okay. So when Jamie assaults her, I didn't say this while we were talking about it. But he looks at her in this like really psychotic way and says, whose pussy is this? And she answers him and says, it's yours. And that part has always thrown me off. Like, it's right after she says, stop, you're hurting me, right? Like, he's trying to treat her as much like a hoe as he possibly can. And she's indulging him in it. Now, the critical question for me there is, is she doing that for him? or herself. Like, even when she refers to the assault later, she calls it quote-unquote semi-rape. She uses the word semi-rape. And I don't necessarily think there can be like a percentage of an assault. Either there was a rape or it didn't. So somewhere in her mind, um, it was assault, but she can't call it that because at that point, she's basically been raped by her ex. And you'd be silly to go back to an ex who raped you, but she has to go back so that she can finish this cycle and get back into her powerful place. But he made her feel wrong about herself. So she mentally justified the assault by allowing herself to actively participate in it, even after telling her that he was hurting her with those two words, it's yours. Now, in an interview in 2014, Spike Lee actually said he regretted putting this scene in the film, saying he felt that he was much less uh, mature at the time, and the scene kind of made light of what is essentially rape. So from his view at the time, this wasn't really assault, but like more like a rough sex on account of being so upset. Understandable from a male viewpoint at some degree, but not at a large degree, because we know that if full consent is not given to everything that's happening, it's not consent. And the moment that she seems pained, the moment that she says, you're hurting me, this is not consent. So it is really unfortunate that uh, that part is so muddy in the film, because it fits very well with the narrative, but it also does not feel good to watch. So the big question, do we agree with Nola? In short, yeah. 
Remember that quote from Zora Neale Hurston that we talked about at the beginning? Men are allowed to manifest their mentalities into reality, even if they're not successful at it. Women are expected to be okay within the confines that society sets for us. Although she almost succumbs to those societal confines with Jamie, Nola breaks that wheel in the end, even if it means going to bed alone. We can see earlier in the film, the first time that she has to essentially sleep by herself, she's not able to, and that's when she calls Jamie over, and the assault occurs. At the end of the film, she's able to climb into bed, put those covers over herself with her candles lit, and have a moment alone. She's allowed to do whatever she'd like with her body, especially as all parties are consenting to the situation, and it's not cheating, okay? Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about myself for a second, not too long, but just I feel like I need to add this in because, like, I mean, this is kind of my movie, and I... (laughs) All right, here we go. So I'm a serial monogamous. I have watched this movie probably six or seven times in my lifetime. And when I was younger, I used to feel like I aligned with Nola's beliefs. When I saw it the first time when I was 16, I was uh, still a virgin. And I felt like, yes, she understands what's going on. Uh, The next time that I saw it, I was in my 20s. And I was like, yes, she gets it. We do not need just one man. We need multiple men. Over the years, I've realized that I have always only dealt with one man at a time. Um, Usually I'm with a guy until at some point he does something that makes me upset, hurts my feelings, we break things off, and then I completely dead them 100%. They are done with me, and then I move on to the next guy. I do not deal with multiple men at a time. I am not capable mentally or emotionally of doing that, right? Um, I cannot be with more than one person at a time because one of them is always going to have to take a back seat. Um, not to get too hard into astrology, but I'm a Scorpio sun, Virgo moon, and Gemini rising, which means my Scorpio sun, I only have the capacity for a certain amount of people at a certain amount of time. So, um, when I meet a guy, if he seems like he seems to have the most potential, I'm going to dedicate all of my energy to that one guy. I don't, I can't spread my energy among multiple people. Um, I have object and people permanence, which is why I put all of my sauces in the produce drawer and I keep my produce out on the shelves because if I don't see it, I will not pay attention to it. Um, if you're in the back seat, babe, can't see you. Um, I recently <laughs> dealt with a person who is very heavily on social media. And so even though we don't necessarily talk that often, I see them often. And so I can't have object permanence for them and like put them into the produce drawer because they always present themselves on my shelf. And so it's a complicated, oh, it's such a complicated situation. Like, but we don't have time to talk about that because we're talking about this movie. Okay. Anyway, um, I have always wished I had the capacity for doing what Nola does and just seeing the good parts in specific men and focusing on that in order to have interactions with them. Because what ends up happening for me is I focus on the bad parts of them. And that makes me not horny. And then I don't want to have sex with them anymore. (laughs) I'm just being honest. I'm so sorry. Um, But a lot of women now are adopting poly lifestyles. Men as well. Um, people are adopting poly lifestyles and have embraced the fact that it may be easier to find a secondary person to satisfy those needs that your primary partner isn't meeting rather than like asking your partner to change who they are to meet your needs or risk finding out what happens when those needs go unfulfilled. There are multiple couples that go years with things that they want not 
being met and then it blows up in their face suddenly very quickly and very violently and you don't want that to happen as well plus the internet exists now back in 1985 there was no internet but now anybody could locate a poly group or community in their area with a few clicks if nola was around now seeking a polyamorous lifestyle she could have found an amazing community here in 2021 but if nola was looking for three faithful guys who would be okay with her non-monogamous choices but would also want to remain monogamous with her i don't know you all let me know if you think that Lola would be happy here in 21. Let me know what you think of, like, her choices. So, if you want to watch it, it's on Netflix. If you have Netflix, I would definitely recommend watching it on, like, a rainy day. Um, the jazz music is perfect. The story works for a solo watch or, like, a couple cuddle session. I wouldn't recommend it for, like, a group watch unless you're like really doing like some film study but this is like a good like couple film or a good film to watch by yourself it's only about an hour and 25 minutes um unless you watch it with somebody and it takes a little bit longer if you gotta pause it a couple times if you know what i'm saying wink wink and anyway support black art support black filmmakers I know Spike isn't necessarily indie anymore. He makes a lot of money. He's doing really well for himself. But his films are always like prime black films and highlight different perspectives of the black experience. And his casting is typically like magnifique. So any Spike Lee films that you can watch, even though he is Spike Lee, I still definitely recommend. All right, well, that's it. I'm calling it. I know that we are over an hour. I'm so sorry, but we had to talk. Now, next week, um, I am actually going on a cruise very soon. So we're going to talk about my favorite show because it'll be a really easy record for me. And I hope you guys enjoy it. That's not a great clue, but there's going to be some mystery, some suspense, some intrigue. And a guy that we have talked about a few times before. And I'm hoping that that gives you a little bit of a hint, a show, and a guy that we've talked about a few times. Okay. So you can't see me, but I'm winking right now. Anyway, follow the podcast on whatever platform you use. And check out the Halaif Pod Instagram. That's H-L-A-Y-F-P-O-D on Instagram, and I usually post movie stills and fun facts over there. I actually realized that I need to go post movie stills from Daddy Long Legs because I forgot to do that. I was really preoccupied with life for a while, <laughs> but I will have, I will go back and post those. They will be late, but they will be posted. Um, I also uh, post some fun facts over there as well. Our website is up. Here's looking podcast.com. That's H E R E S A L O O K I N P O D C A S T dot com. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at, at film underscore Nikki. That's at F I L M underscore N I K K I. I post some stuff about the podcast, but mostly I am just a mess. It's a Twitter. I don't really know how to Twitter yet, but um, hopefully you just follow me over there. It's fine. And you guys can send any collab requests, advice, movie recommendations, general greeting. Can you hear my nails? I'm doing that. With, I'm clicking my nails. Anyway, you can send any of that stuff to here's looking podcast at gmail.com. That's similar to the podcast. That's H E R E S L O O K I N P O D C A S T at gmail.com. Also, follow me on Good Pods. I've been getting really good ratings over there. I'm pretty high on the list of film podcasts over there. So I'm super excited that somebody's been listening to me over there so um download good pods it's a really cool if you if you enjoy podcasts and you'd like to separate it from like your music stuff maybe you listen to like music on your apple um or spotify or wherever and you want to keep your podcast in a separate place good pods it's a really awesome app um that allows you to rate subscribe and follow along with some of your favorite podcasts and get them rated higher than some of those like big podcasts that like who cares about them 
Get your favorite indie podcast up there. Get us up there. I also have in my uh, link tree bio a buy me a coffee link. I know I've mentioned this before, but if um, for some reason you guys feel like, oh, she sounds so tired or she sounds like she needs some milk, um, you guys can contribute to my buy me a coffee. Um, it'll help me to keep the podcast uh, going. It'll keep me the web page up. Um, some of the other subscriptions that I subscribe to to keep the podcast going, it'll help out with that. And in general, um, it'll buy me a coffee. So either way, um, I know we are way over the hour mark, but I hope you guys enjoyed this episode of the podcast. Um, this is one of my favorite ones to record and, um, I'm sure, um, we'll talk about some other black films pretty soon. Um, but next week, um, we are actually, like I said, we're going to talk about one of my favorite shows. Thank you for tuning in. And if I don't see you, good afternoon. Good evening. That's a hint for the next show. (laughs) Good evening and good night.